a momentous year of news. In early spring, the great forces of nature brought havoc to Southern California. An unprecedented rainfall and record floods inundated an area of three million population, taking a toll of more than 100 lives and a property damage of 25 million. In late September, nature again rebelled. A West Indian hurricane, without warning, raked the Atlantic coastline. Hundreds of lives were lost. Homes, farms, land and sea transportation were demoralized and destroyed. The New England states were hardest hit. Thousands were rendered homeless by the fury of angry nature. A $150 million hurricane. The East, worst tropical storm. All Holland applauds the royal christening of Crown Princess Juliana's baby girl. Later in the year, Queen Wilhelmina gains world acclaim when she celebrates 40 years of a happy, peaceful reign. Riddle Spain, brother continues to annihilate brother. Franco's insurgent army captures city after city. Hundreds of thousands of non-combatants suffer the indescribable horrors of a continuous nightmare of fear and destruction, a tragic price for power. China is crushed by Japan's modern engines of destruction. Throughout the year, Nippon's fighting hordes continue their conquest of China's principal cities. The good earth trembles again and again in an irrepressible drive on Hankow. Seasoned troops storm the war-riddled path to China's capital. Resistance is shattered as the invading army pushes on from Peiping to Canton, from Shanghai to Hankow. Land and air forces relentlessly assault key defenses. Direct hits demolish city after city. Here, the invader's destruction takes no holiday. A grateful nation honors a brave sailor for heroism during the bombing of the ill-fated USS Panay. Lieutenant Anders struggled valiantly to aid startled survivors. To him, the Navy's coveted emblem of honor and the firm salute of a thankful nation. <music> Highest honors from Queen's University at Kingston, Ontario. Here the United States Chief Executive attracts world comment with this unprecedented statement. I give to you assurance that the people of the United States will not stand idly by if domination of Canadian soil is threatened by any other empire. Later, he visits the newly completed Thousand Islands Bridge and joins with Canada's Prime Minister, Mackenzie King, in dedicating this true symbol of international peace and progress. Pomp and circumstance mark the royal visit to Paris of Britain's beloved George VI and Queen Elizabeth. All France acclaims the monarchs as they ride through the historic boulevards of the nation's capital to the Arc de Triomphe. The magnificent state banquet crowns the events of an historic day. Later, King George at the tomb of France's unknown soldier pays humble tribute to France's World War heroes. With Austria's surrender accomplished, Germany's Chancellor opens the 13th Nazi Congress at Nuremberg. 
Here he thunders his war threat to an anxious worldwide audience and demands the right to self-determination for 3,500,000 Sudeten Germans. President Benesch dramatically rejects Germany's ultimatum. Deep shadows of another world war spread over the universe. The small nation prepares for war as thousands of Sudetans flee to Germany. In mid-September, with Europe seemingly headed for disaster, England's Neville Chamberlain takes a now historic step. The Prime Minister flies to Berchtesgarten to personally plead for peace with the German Chancellor. All the world breathlessly awaits the outcome of this dramatic meeting. The deadline is October 1st. War now seems certain. France swells its armed forces to more than two million. Britain's home fleet is ordered to the North Sea, and simultaneously, the nation's armed resources are hurriedly mobilized. In London, riots break out among the people of a frenzied nation. Italy's Mussolini arouses his nation to support Germany. When another world war seems only hours away, the heads of the four powers hastily convene at Munich. The Sudeten land is surrendered. Hitler, Chamberlain, Mussolini and Delarger jointly sign a memorable state document and a new hope for world peace is born. October 1st, the Sudeten frontier gates are raised. Time and time alone will tell whether the Munich Pact means enduring peace for Europe and the world. Twenty years ago, the engines of war destroyed the Cathedral of Reims, a world-renowned shrine. Now philanthropy has restored this famed place of worship. Reims rises again, a majestic symbol of peace and happiness. At New Orleans, the Eighth National Eucharistic Congress is held. Cardinal Mundelein imparts the sacred papal blessing to a vast audience, a solemn assembly of inspiration. England successfully launches the now famous pickaback plane, the Mercury. On its first flight, it crossed from Foynes, Ireland to Manhasset Bay with a stop at Montreal, all in 25 hours. France's air achievement, a six-motored, 70-passenger Sky Mistress arrives at Fort Washington, Long Island, completing the first commercial transatlantic hop overseas. America's biggest transatlantic airplane is launched, another major contribution to aviation's forward march. Smashing all records, Howard Hughes outdoes Jules Verne's wildest dream. Around the world from New York to New York in four days. New aviation history is written when this Lockheed monoplane returns swiftly and safely with its crew of four. A real sportsman, a daring aviator, a true pioneer of the world's airways. On the heels of the Hughes flight, Douglas G, gone again Corrigan, and his nine-year-old crate make unexpected sky history. Corrigan flew the Atlantic by mistake and flew right into the hearts of the world. From New York to Ireland in 28 hours, then back to America, back to a waiting, cheering multitude. Here he is, wrong way Corrigan, who made the east the west, the west the east, and history upside down. Thank <laughs> you.